Hello all to this month's July 2022 BIMX team meeting. My name is Dana DeFillaby coming to you from my home office in Washington, DC. And for those of you who are new to BIMXT, welcome. For those of you guys who have been coming within the last two years, we celebrated our two year anniversary last meeting in May. Welcome back. We have Mural, as you can see in the chat, Allison has joined, uh, shared the chat there, uh, the link in the chat rather, and you can see that I am sharing it. Please feel free to participate within the mural. It's really meant for you. You can see in the top left corner that we have a bunch of information related to the BIMXT network. A lot of this information is clickable. So the survey, for example, any of the information next to the advisors, if you double click on that, you can actually get to our information. So please feel free to link up with us. And in particular, make sure that you join up on the BIMX Team Network group on LinkedIn. We have today a presentation on landscape architecture, a lot of stuff to go over. So jump right into it. We have a tip today. You can actually see over on the far right, we have a tip by Amanda. Amanda will be talking about uh, three new tools for landscape architects. So definitely some really awesome things to share. We then have Lauren Schmidt with Parallax. You guys don't know of Parallax. They have some really great tools that they offer, including foreground, which is what she will be talking about today, which focuses on two main topics, floor slab editing and planting. Then we have Dan Warren, one of the advisors himself. You guys have, who have been coming probably have chatted with Dan. He's going to be talking about InfraWorks and how we can use that with Formit, two programs that I am not familiar with at all, so I'm super excited about. We definitely, once again, want you to engage with us. You can see we already have some people engaging with us as far as their location, which is fantastic. Allison has come in here and actually added a few extra, to, uh, one of these kind of placeholders, if you will. But you can see each one of these groupings has essentially a discipline icon. I am BIM IT, right? So I have the laptop icon. So I can either come over and just kind of drag that over, or I can leave it there, right click and duplicate that and share some information. Make sure at the very least that you share where you're coming from in terms of today. We will give a $25 gift card to a random participant next meeting. From last meeting, our two year anniversary, we actually had a special prize that goes to Christopher Alexander. Congratulations, you win a Dell Precision laptop for that amazing tip that you shared. Thank you so much to Dell Intel. And of course, if you're not subscribed to Datamo BIM already, make sure that you are, selfless plug. So without further ado, we're gonna jump into our tip Amanda, how are you today? Doing great. How are you doing? Doing pretty good. I will. Excited to see your three tips. Me too. So I, I am excited to you. show them. Uh, let's just make sure. There we go. Can you see my screen? Let's see here. I sure can. Okay, perfect. Great. Well, hi, everybody. My name is Amanda Marin, and I'm a landscape architect working in-house here at Land Effects in San Luis Obispo, California. But I'm originally from around Toronto, Canada. So nice to see you. Hope to um, have some people that I've met in the past uh, here today. Probably a lot of you, I hope, um, already know about Land Effects as um, we use it as an essential AutoCAD plugin for landscape architects over there in AutoCAD with planting, site, hardscape, des uh, detail tools and for irrigation designers. And likely some of you have seen that we have a 3D connection uh, to plugins in SketchUp and Rhino too, but we always have our ears open to which programs designers are using that could use a plugin. <laughs> and Revit was a big one that a lot of people asked for. So that's what I'm gonna be showing off today is a little bit of that, um, some of the tools in there. We have a beta plugin going right now uh, with Revit. It's already being tested and used by dozens of firms 
that have already used land effects before with some really impressive projects. And I'm going to be showing you all three tips on tools that utilize the user friendly ability to add plants in our plant manager and then what you can do from there. Um, we are going to be going over some group labels, some highlight tools and a photo call out as well. So if you uh, have used land effects in CAD, and feel free to chime in in the chat if you have, uh, you probably recognize this plant manager over here. I got to it from the uh, plant manager icon up here in our planting FX ribbon. And um, I've already started to add a lot of plants into here. It's really easy to do. I, if I want to add a new one, I can just click new. I can search for something like, I don't think I have a tilia in here, so I can go grab that. You can search for botanical or common name, and I can go ahead and grab uh, one of these. I usually go for that one, even a lot of different varieties, but I'm just gonna add this one in. Click done. And once I've got that, I can edit it and a little bit more user friendly right you got a lot of uh, you can set a bunch of parameters to it like sizes uh, over here oh, number 10 probably i'll go for like a two inch caliper maybe wire basket and i can choose a um um a family for it i'll go with this one and i can choose a symbol width as well in either feet or meters so once i've got that down and i go ahead and place it in my model in here, um, I can do some of my tips with it. So I've kind of placed a few in here and I go to site. You can see them over here and I can kind of move them around, but I can also start labeling my, thing, my plants in here. So I'll show you two types of labels. We've got group label. So I can grab one of these. I can box over. And it's okay if I choose some of the other plants in here, it's going to know which one I mean. And then I just place that label off to the side. And now that is a regular old Revit tag label. So you can move that around just like you might have already tried doing yourself in Revit. I also have a different style of label that I can do. I can do a connecting line label. So uh, this is a big style in landscape architecture. I just picked the first one. I picked the second one. You can see that line starting to form. I picked the third one, hit escape, and pop that down. And that counts that up. Uh, so once I've started doing all of this, of course, I have some other tools that come into play, uh, like verify labels, but I'm going to show off highlight because I really like it. So if I use highlight, I can start analyzing my drawing and finding things. So if I want to make sure, okay, which ones, which plants exactly is that label labeling, or especially for maybe this one, if I do highlight on this one, because since it doesn't have connecting lines, I can see all of the plants that it's actually labeling. I can also use highlight, say, uh, just on a plant in the drawing, and it will actually highlight all of the plants of that type over here. And I can highlight from the plant manager. So I can grab over here and click highlight down here. And that highlights all the, of those plants in my drawing so I can find them all. You know. Another thing I can do is um, you can start like finding and replacing them and changing up the symbols, all of that. But uh, one of the other tools, uh, tips that I wanted to show in addition to highlight and group label was photo call out. So, um, I have a sheet, just a really simple sheet going on down here. Very simple plan just to show off what's happening here. Oh, if I want to turn off highlight, by the way, um, I can just click highlight again and hit escape and it will unhighlight. But let's go back to that sheet, double click inside, and I'm going to drop down and grab photo call out instead. And we're going to grab this plant right here. And that's going to pull open a just a quick search of images available for you to choose from on the internet. So I can choose one of these. And it's going to ask me to place it down. So I can place that down right here. It's a little big at the moment, but I can double click inside and adjust that down to something a bit more appropriate. 
finish. It's a group, so I can easily move that along, around with its tag in here. And I can keep going through and put in photos so I can create a nice presentation document for my clients to understand, even inside Revit, what exactly we're, we're giving to them. But yeah, those are my three quick tips. Awesome tips. That was so fantastic how it actually links right up to the web. Talk about easy which not many things are when it comes to bringing in images <laughs> into Revit, right? Exactly. Very, very That's what we're cool. going for. We're trying to just make it super user-friendly and easy. Well, if those are three tips, I'm sure that you have a bunch more. <laughs> so make sure you guys check out Land of X. Thank you so much, Amanda. And we'll definitely make sure if any questions, which you guys make sure you throw up in mural, either under the questions, under um her presentation there or under just info to share really wherever we will see it of course as well if you are just on your phone or what have you and you can only throw it in the zoom chat that is absolutely fine we are checking that out too next up oh is actually question how can we create the sidewalk and road to match the slope of the topo model and does the photo search make sure the images are open source or two questions there. Uh, should I write out the answer or talk about the answer? Uh, if they're quick, you can talk about them. If they're a little bit longer, maybe the chat would be better. Okay. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, you can still see my screen, right? Sure can. Um, I think this one is actually, uh, I was kind of putting this in to show off some ground covers that I forgot to do during my tips, because you can also label, uh, sorry, group label those ground covers as well. So I placed a ground cover on, th on this floor in here. Oh, I'm in the sheet. And uh, that one is actually set with a spacing. Um, so if I rectangle over that ground cover and place that down, it will actually show me how many plants are in there. So sorry, that is not a sidewalk. That is uh, an actual ground cover uh, assigned to a floor. And that one, you just add a ground cover in here, double click to place and place it on a floor and it places in there and it just adds in a bunch of parameters. And then um, I forgot the second one. The other was uh, open source images. Open source images. I believe there is, uh, when I pull that in, uh, go search for images, there's a drop down on that web page where you can choose what type of uh, image source. And uh, soon to be in here, it's in our other version already, you can actually browse to an image on your own computer as well. Fantastic. It's like as you guys have really thought of everything. Well, if you guys think of new questions for her as the other presenters are going, please feel free to throw them in the chat. Next up, we have Lauren Schmidt. How are you today, Lauren? Hi, I'm doing good. Good All to right, see you me... today. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me here. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen as well. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'll just give a little bit of background. I'm also a landscape architect. Uh, I work at Parallax team. So we are a small BIM consultancy uh, with the rest of us being architects. I, I lead the landscape side of things, but I've, so I've been working in Revit and sites and landscapes for about 10 years now. Worked at a couple, couple of firms. Um, and so I've been at Parallax now for, for two years and I've built essentially been kind of building out our landscape side. So we do kind of like a little bit of everything. We do building project templates, content libraries, training and implementation, project modeling. Um, and then we also build out landscape apps as well. So that's, I'm gonna be focusing on foreground here. Um, but I thought I'd just give a little bit more background and pull up an old project to look at first before we kind of get into the live demo. Um, I saw there was a kind of question there. Um, so this is an old project of mine that's actually currently under construction. It's the, it's the Washington State Convention Center here in Seattle. Um, this is just kind of an example of a big urban project. And I only have the landscape turned on, so it looks a little funny. But you can see kind of what a landscape 
uh, and Revit starts to look like. And um, this is kind of a good example of a big urban project that's composed almost entirely of floors. Um, so, and this is kind of the approach and something I'll be talking about in foreground as well, but when you're working with, uh, when you're working on an urban project in particular, but also like when you're working with like real thicknesses of paving and hardscape, topography isn't always super useful. So we often find ourselves using a lot of the architectural tools and a lot of that tends to be floors. So you can see this landscape is composed. We have, we have like wood decks, we have stone, we have concrete, and a lot of that is floors, floors and walls and planting. Um, so yeah, you can start to see yeah, what that looks like. And this is a pretty, massive project. It's a big kind of super block. So we have, you can see it kind of wraps around here. We have some stuff on structure up here. It looks like it's floating because the, the architecture is uh, turned off. Um, but yeah, that it's is- very cool. Very cool to see a project that's actually being built. Yeah, so it's currently being built right now. Um, but I, yeah, so this was at GGN. I'm no longer at GGN, but it's a kind of a good example of of not an NDA project. So many of the projects that we work on, we can't like share what they look like, but that is one of them. So I'm gonna flip back over here and kind of show off what foreground can do. Yeah, this is 2018. So we're gonna speed forward into the present and <laughs> hop into Revit 23 over here. Um, so yeah, so this is our foreground ribbon. Um, and this is a tool set that kind of, I spent the first year at Parallax kind of building up. And so this is built on all of my knowledge of working in Revit for like 10 years. And it kind of started Beautiful out. Thumbnails. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I've, I've kind of made everything here myself with a little bit of help from John Pearson, if anyone knows Parallax or John Pearson, he's it's kind of our brains behind our app development here at Parallax. So he kind of helped get us get this all started and off the ground. Um, but I've been running with it for over a year and a half now. Um, and so, yeah, it's built on originally kind of just out of the box Revit. And then from there, we built it out initially with Dynamo. We kind of prototyped a lot of it. And now it is a full app uh, in C Sharp. So um, just to, I'll kind of highlight the different tool sets we have here. We have a few topography tools. Like I said, our main focus is on floor and slab editing because um, we found that, that that is really what the bread and butter of a landscape and Revit is. You want to be working with floors because floors have actual thickness. You can actually grade them. Um, and so that's, I'll be demonstrating kind of a lot of these more powerful tools. We have some quick big hardscape tools, they essentially let you generate wall stairs curbs as railings by just like picking edges. Um, and then we have some planting placement tools. I'll also kind of show how those work as well. Um, but in general, planting, planting in Revit, like you can do it out of the box. It does some of the, like Revit does some things out of the box well, like it does schedules pretty well. But what we are trying to do with foreground is we're trying to augment um, this is kind of the stuff that's a little bit harder. So like plant mixes, placing, tagging and updating those plants, we're trying to basically help automate all the stuff. So that's essentially that is kind of the summary of foreground of what we're trying to do is like Revit does so much stuff good already. And like out of the box, it can do a lot of this stuff, but we're trying to, to automate it um, and just make it much faster and easier for you to do it. And then we have a few other annotation helper tools as well. So I will jump right in. I'm trying to I always lose my chat. There it is. Uh, okay, so I'll just hop right in and jump into the floor slab editing tools. So the first one here is drape slabs. So I believe we did have a question about that earlier as far as draping floors to match topography. So that's what you can do with drape. Um, drape actually lets you pick floors, roof, or topography as a host. We're going to start off with topography and then I'll show floors. So you can pick a bunch of slabs. I'm just going to grab all these. So I went ahead. These are all kind of just flat floors that I went ahead and made in this sample file. Um, and then we're going to drape them on the topography. So you can also grab hosts from a link. I'm not doing that right now. And then 
by default, it's going to try to grab a topography host for you, but then you can change that host if it doesn't kind of select correctly. But you can see it's grabbing that topography, which is the one I want. And then we have a number of calculation methods for getting exterior and, and interior points. So if I flip just to boundary points, you'll see um, that it's just going to highlight kind of the bare minimum I need to shape edit all those floors up to the topography. Um, the intersecting contours is, is sort of my favorite method. And you can see it basically finds where all those slabs intersect the contour lines and it gets those points as well. Um, and then you can also do just a specified interval. So that's a five foot interval. That throws a lot of points in there. So I tend to not work with that, but you can if that's what you're trying to do. And then you can also get interior points. Um, the first option is none. You can get all the interior points within the slab. So then it's going to go ahead and grab all the interior points. And then you can also put an interval along the contour lines if you want more points again. Um, and then we have a couple other options down here. So I'll just go ahead and hit none. So that'll reduce our runtime. Uh, you could have options to reset the slab, option if you want to enable a point offset. So if I uncheck that, it's going to be zero. Otherwise, it's going to default to the thickness of the floor. In this case, we have multiple floors, so it's going to default to the, the smallest thickness of the floor. So I'll go ahead and run that, and then we'll see how those all will offset a little bit above topography. Really elegant interface. Yeah, and what we are trying to do also with kind of all of our tools, and you'll see that, is we try to give you like an initial preview so you, before you run stuff, so you can kind of see what you're going to get before you run. That way you it can reduce the amount of iterations you have to run through. Um, so that is, yeah, I just went ahead and do, did all of those. So I'm going to go over here and take a look at another one of these, and we're going to redrape. I'm just going to show how you can drape onto other slabs. And so this is particularly helpful if you're working on a structure, if you're working with multiple slabs, or you're hosting on top of like a roof slabs. Um, so I'm going to change the host to this slab. And where you can start to do is you can you can either start to offset up or you can start to off offset down. Um, I'm going to offset this one up. So if you have like planting soil, that's, that's what this is. You can offset things, those on top of roof slabs that are existing. Or sometimes you have soil that's like below a paving surface that you want to host it directly and have it follow perfectly. If you have big soil cells or if you have different situations on structure where you, you're going to have soil below paving, you can do the same thing and you can offset it down. Um, so yeah, that's how that works. So drape is kind of like, that's a big starting point. If you have either a big topography surface that you want to follow that's, that's from civil, or if you, yeah, if you're doing all sorts of complicated things on structure, it can be really useful too. All right, I'm going to zoom back here so you very can see. Very nice and very useful in so many applications. So yeah. quick, too. Yeah, I mean, that's the benefit. Like, you can do some a lot of the stuff with Dynamo, but this is all in C Sharp and C Sharp. Well, and I just... see that that Nick uh, had mentioned that in the chat, that there's a Dynamo plugin that can do that. And I bet you were the one that created it. <laughs> or at least one of the ones who created the dynamo workflows for it yeah. because i remember seeing your workflows at one of the main conferences so yeah and so that's how a lot of this stuff started out um and you can do a lot of this stuff with dynamo um like when you start some of the stuff gets really complicated in dynamo, in dynamo but some of the stuff is is relatively simple but even like the difference between like a dyna like running this in Dynamo, it could like sit here and churn and churn and churn mm -hmm. for like it's processing so much information. Yeah, it, yeah, it's, that is one thing that we always like talk through with our landscape clients when they're they're starting in like Revit implementation is yeah, site modeling is like really intensive, and having it be in an app and held in C sharp will just it does make it so much faster. Um, so yeah, that is one thing to keep in mind. So. Moving along on our slab editing tools, some of the other powerful ones we have here, um, which will let you kind of do a little bit more fine tune grading here in Revit. So we have grade edges. Um, yeah, we're we are focused primarily in Revit. There's a question in the chat about that. Um, so grade essentially lets you grade edges 
and we have a few different methods. You can basically set it, specify a slope of a single set of edges. Um, you can adjust the slope, essentially like pu push and pull edges up and down, or my favorite method is basically adjust and slope, but you can do this in a lot of different combinations. Um, so I'll, I'm gonna go ahead and demonstrate how this can work. So but it looks also, um, there's a question uh, in terms of how the topo was created. It's, you know, kind of that same idea in terms of garbage in, garbage out, right? You want to start mm -hmm. with a good topo right. surface first with the good points that you need, um, hopefully minimized. And, you know, you're not grabbing a point every centimeter. Right. Yeah, it, it is true. It doesn't matter how the topo is made. And the, the thing about, and with newer versions of Revit, I forget what, you can you can link in a topography if you have a 360 directly from Civil 3D, and you can use a true Civil 3D surface to do that drape, um, which will improve your accuracy, accuracy mm -hmm. definitely. Um, which is so good, especially for firms like mine at Smith Group, where we have a landscape department internally. Yeah, definitely. Um, and so, yeah, we we do that, and we've done that with some of our clients as well, that they want to be able to get that better surface. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'm doing here and what I can do with basically this, this method is I can use this great adjust and slope to basically like smooth out some of these areas where I might not necessarily want to have all this kind of choppy grading. And I essentially what I can do is I can, I picked an edge that I actually want to just keep at zero. So I use that edge as my, essentially my control. And then I pick the edges that I want to slope, which are these two sets of side edges. And I can essentially say, um, I can uncheck the specified slope and it's basically just going to connect those edges so that I can make that one continuous slope. So I'm going to go ahead and run that and you'll see basically it smooths it out along that edge. So I can throw a quick spot slope on there and you'll see like this edge is now all consistent at 9.8 and this other edge still pretty steep, but but it, it shows you kind of what the power of great edges can do. Um, and then you can do something similar, but you can do it like in the cross slope direction as well. Uh, so if I hop over here, yep, <laughs> there's a question. So that's what I was just going to show mm -hmm. next. So you can do the same thing. So if I know like I want to keep this edge as my control and I want to move this edge, what I'm going to do is I'm going to essentially, I'm going to tell it I'm going to adjust this edge, but I'm going to say I'm adjusting it to zero. So essentially I'm not adjusting it. And then I can pick all these cross slopes um, here, and then I can tell it, that I want those cross slopes to be that 1.5, or if actually I want that to be a negative 1.5, we'll see it adjusts those points accordingly. And then I'll run that. Um, 1.5 is, is a common cross slope. It's hard to see it, but yeah, now you'll see that all those all those edges are now 1.5%. So essentially, grade edges allows you to do grading in Revit, and you can specify slopes and lots of different combinations. Um, but essentially like our slab tools are kind of all meant to be used together and in lots of different combinations. So sometimes you have to kind of think through like, what are you starting with? What's your end goal? And like, how, how do you get there? Uh, Align edges is another tool that we have in the toolbox as well. So what you can do, and again, similar to grade, it has a few different options. You can align to slabs, you can align to edges, it has some align and slope option as well. Um, so I'm just going to click align this one up over here. And you can use these in lots of different combinations also. So I'm going to quick just bring this edge up so it aligns to this slab. And then I can, you can see this one's kind of all out of plane. And this is common if you're working, if you're working on urban sites, you have a lot of like paving edges that are meeting. Um, we don't have pre-programs for landing it, landings and runs at this point. Um, that is something that we have clients ask about. And yeah, so we do look at like incorporating new features um, as we're kind of able and as it's feasible. Um, let's see, I'm gonna pick these slabs to align that guy too. And then you'll see. So it's basically it tells you found two adjacent slabs, it found four points, and basically I'm going to bring these four points up uh, along the edge. So now it's all happily and plain. There we go. All right. And then we have a few other. You can split and merge shape edited slabs. Um, 
I'm gonna go show off fixed points. So when you're working, actually, let me do it. Explode too. So yeah, we have a few different helpers. You can adjust points. You can adjust area. Essentially, that lets you like raise and lower either an isolated area or like a whole slab altogether. Um, and then we also have fixed points as a helper. I'm going to show off. And then we also have explode, which oftentimes like I have an example here where you have like a slab that has multiple loops. But something sometimes that happens initially, and then you don't want it to be like that later. So you can I can explode these, um, and then it's going to basically split those off into two separate slabs. And then the other thing I wanted to show, um, so oftentimes when you're working with shape edited slabs, um, if you go to like edit a boundary and you add um, or even remove segments, you can start to have problems with, uh, your points. So we have rough in another segment of this floor. So yeah, you'll see what happens there is essentially you drop all those points um, because we're working from sea level. And that's often how we'll work as landscape architects. Um, so fixed points is sort of a quick helper that we have. Um, oh, shoot, that one isn't, I swear I tested this one earlier. <laughs> There's a couple bugs that we're still working on. It's the beauty now. of a live demo. <laughs> I know, it's true. Um, maybe I did it. I did it earlier. I know it works sometimes. But essentially what fixed points tries to do is it interpolates points back up. Let me try it on this one. But all of these tools seems like it takes it from, you know, actually just following the topo to following code, right? Like it's making it real. Yeah. And so oftentimes, yeah, a landscape architect wants to be, they don't, sometimes civil is doing all the grading and you're just following civil, in which case straight is fine. But oftentimes you're doing des like actual live design and Revit. Um, so let's see if I can run fix on this guy. Yeah, there it goes. There we go. So yeah, fix, what essentially fix is trying to do is it's find, trying to find points that are like way out of range and basically it reinterpolates and brings them back up as, as like, just essentially like a best guess. Uh, but the very least, if the, if it doesn't work, you could probably just reset and then reapply yeah, the topo. Yeah, you can you can do a redrape also. The issue with redrape is if you've done like other things, like if you've aligned or graded, like you might not want to like entirely reset your surface, which is why we have fix as like kind of a helper for that. Um, but it's still a best guess, so you would probably still need to come back and like regrade it. Okay, and yeah, there's Aaron's over there answering questions in the chat. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, we have some quick pick tools, and maybe we'll come back if you have some time to show how those off, show those work. Um, but I wanted to quick go through some planting tools. Um, so yeah, we do have our own planting library and like tools that go with that planting library, and that's separate from foreground. Um, but essentially, what what we ship in foreground is we are trying to fix kind of some of the basic problems with Revit, as I mentioned. So um, they focus on plant mixes, basically placing plants more easily, being able to update and tag and sort of group and associate those plants more easily as well. So let me toggle over to my planting views and we'll take a look at what that looks like. Um, and so the beauty with our planting tools is, yeah, if you have plant content that you already have, in your firm that you want to use, you're free, you're free to use any any planting content that you want to use. Um, yeah, like I said, we do have our own libraries that some of our clients prefer to use. Uh, so a quick go into this plant mixes dialog. So the way the mixes work is essentially you can define mixes from plants, uh, plants that are already loaded in the project. So you can see I have some mixes here. So this is basically grass and shrub mix, it has a name, it has a spacing, and it has like three different types, each with like a percentage associated to it. And then I can, and then yeah, you can update them from here as well. So if I flip over to this grass mix, yeah, I can say, actually, I want this to be a 50-50 mix. I can update that mix. And now my grass mix has been updated from here as well. Um, 
and then yeah so that's kind of that's kind of the first base layer of our planting tools and then from there you can use those um, those mixes that you make in the placement tools so the first one is fill area which lets you uh, fill areas and an area is either like room an area or a floor essentially and you can fill those are so you can use you can use a single type you don't have to use the mixes um, but then you can oh, the mixes will appear here in a drop down so I can grab like my grass and shrub mix you can do multiple areas um, so I can come down here and I can like do like five of or three or four of them at once um, and then what you can see what it does is it does a few things similar to what our drape tool does it, it tries to find a host for you it defaults to a topography um, but you can also change it to a floor host and then the triangular spacing is the default spacing. Um, if I uncheck that, you'll see it changes to a grid spacing. And then there's also a wiggle, which basically like creates a, a random <laughs> threshold. So if I like up this to one, uh, you'll start to see basically the XY is gonna be randomized within the one foot range. If I make that smaller, it becomes like a little bit tighter. Or if I set that back to zero, you'll see that perfect grid. Um, and then you can also change the direction. So if I want, these are all gonna have to be together, but essentially I can change that direction so that they're all oriented along that edge. And then I can run that and it's gonna fill all of those areas uh, with that plant mix. And then sort of the third layer that we're doing is after the plants are placed, we create an association of the plants. So if I grab one of these plants, you'll see my properties palette. Um, we push a few shared parameters in to help us keep track of the plants for you. So we assign all like groupings, what we call, it's not a true Revit group, we call it a group, but it's essentially like a grouping and it's, it's a, we're keeping track of a database on the back end. Um, and it also will put that mix in there. So you can schedule that out. It's a shared parameter that will appear in your schedule. So if you want to sort all your schedules by the mix, you can do that. Um, so yeah, you can see this one is 01, this one is 05, and that's 06. Um, and so the nice thing about that is now you can either tag them all. So I can do a quick tag all, and it's going to tag all of my, um, all of my plant groupings. We also have a linear, so you can place them along lines, or if you have plants already placed, like oftentimes trees, you're, you're going to place those manually anyway, you can come back and create a manual association, and then you can still use the tag all and the update tools. Um, but when you do tag all, basically it's going to find every type within the grouping. It's going to place a tag, um, and then the nice thing is, then we can all we can update those stuff. So what we can do is we can move these tags apart. So by default, like I have some settings that they're all going to pull from like this upper right corner. But I can kind of pull these apart so that when I update, um, they they don't like all stay smashed together. <laughs> I'm going to move this one around a little bit so we can see that. And then I'm going to run an update so we can see what happens. Um, and then now in 23, also, you'll see in all previous versions of 23, we were, we were managing this group count with a shared parameter that we were basically pushing in there. But now with 23, um, there's multi-leader hosting that's it, basically supports nice clean hosting. So you can see um, we're supporting that fully natively. So that, that is one thing with foreground where we try to support kind of everything native Revit out of the box, like how you would expect it to be as much as we can. because that's, that's something that's important to us at Parallax and we use these tools ourselves. Um, so we want kind of everything to, to work as well as it can. Um, so I'll do another quick. Well, and since you referenced here. 23, I was just looking because Aaron had answered the question about the interior edges in visibility graphics. Mm -hmm. um, in 23, it doesn't look like that's a, an option. It looks like there's folding lines. Is that yeah, the, they've, okay. they've renamed that. They, yeah, they've done some. You know, why wouldn't they? <laughs> what? Because why wouldn't they? Of course they did. <laughs> yeah, so they've, they basically added two subcategories so that you have the option to basically they've broken it apart so you've broken have more it apart control. so that you have more control essentially so yeah but yeah they did rename it so uh, yeah I'm not so sure. i will pick, paste that in the 
mural so that everybody can see the difference between 22 and 23, because that is a subcategory difference that, as you can see from Lauren's graphics, she's turning off some of those interior edges in her plants and making them nice and pretty. But yes, yeah. absolutely. I can see that the plant mixes is definitely something that here at Smith Group, we, we use quite a bit. So that would save a tremendous amount of time. Yeah, so the, the the kind of the final piece is like is is the updating that, that we that we do with this, so that I can like resize this area, um, and this is one of the reasons actually we use rooms or areas is it makes it easier. Like if you have a floor, that's great, but then when you have adjacent floors, you suddenly have to like edit multiple adjacent boundaries. With rooms or areas, you can just like start dragging these, and those rooms or areas will just kind of update and refill. Occasionally, yeah, you'll get stuff will you have to you have to move them around a little bit um, but then I'll do a quick update all and what it's going to do is it's going to look for um, it's going to kind of toggle through them all and find the ones that have changed significantly uh, within a pretty small threshold and then it's going to replace all of those plants and you'll see basically what it does is it does like delete and replace all those plants but it remembers where all those tags are and then it replaces those tags um, in a pretty non-destructive way like because it is a mix and or it is a little bit of randomness, like you'll, things will move around a little bit, but you'll see like all the tags remained where they were. So that's something that, yeah, we kind of work hard to make it, make it as user-friendly as possible. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, make sure that you keep your questions coming. Wonderful, wonderful tools that you guys have been showing. So next up, Dan, how is it going today, Dan? I am fantastic. Just make sure you can hear me, right? Sure. Can. Yeah, awesome, awesome. All right, let me switch over to PowerPoint. And uh, I am not as brave as um, you all. I won't the go. The live demos are scary. They're definitely I won't do the, especially with InfoWorks. So those of you who aren't familiar <laughs> with InfoWorks, um, unlike Revit, it's, it's very optimized, so it will use as many of your computer resources as it can so like when i'm trying to like do a presentation and stream and you zoom like it's just it can be a little bit much for this little the little hamster that keeps my machine working so um okay cool so my name is dan warren I, i'm the bin manager for mcmillan paz and smith um i i have a lot to get through because i'm really excited about this workflow um what we're going to talk about is going basically from um infoworks into Formit and sort of how do you generate a site in InfoWorks, what you can do in InfoWorks, and then how do you prep that to bring it into Formit and use it in Formit. So this is very much for like preliminary design. Our last two tools are very much, I think, geared towards design uh, documentation or construction documentation. And this is very much, much more free form, um, which is what I really like about it. So um, let's get into it. So this is not the whole workflow we're going to cover today. This is uh, the map that I used to explain kind of how it all works. Um, so where's my pointer? So starting up here, um, InfoWorks pulls in information from lots of different sources um, and it compiles it. And you would really use InfoWorks for doing like site development, buildings, topographies, things like that. Um, it does have tie-ins for Civil 3D and GIS workflows. Um, I am not going to um, cover those today, but what we're going to focus on is really the connection between InfraWorks and Formant. And then, of course, once you go to Formant, that's where, like, all the fun happens. I don't know if the, is the Zoom window blocking the right side of my screen? Nope. Okay, good. So, um, yeah, and this is where in Formant and Revit, we can go back and forth for, like, those bespoke design elements. And then, of course, you can always sprinkle a little Dynamo magic in there to make it happen. Um, and we've got um, access to the design performance tools like Insight. So what we're really going to focus on is just this piece right here. And I'm going to show you like it's really, really simple to get going because um, InfoWorks is just a, a sandbox. So you use a tool called the Model Builder. And I'm going to go to Durham, North Carolina, because it's a cool little city if you've never been there. Um, you can only bring in about a 200 square kilometer site, which is about 75 square meter uh, miles in, in freedom units. And once I pick my site, I can use the satellite to kind of drill in and get a good idea on like where I'm going to be looking. I could pull in the whole image or just like select an area. Um, I actually prefer to use a polygon. So I'm just going to draw in a little polygon here. Let me get rid of my pointer. 
And um, <clears throat> and this is the side I'm going to end up pulling in. And, and that's that's the hardest part of this whole process. Um, so draw your little area. Okay, so this is where you name your project. Um, so I'm going to name it Durham, North Carolina, and this is just a demo. So then we're going to set the coordinate system. And if you're not familiar with the coordinate systems, it's really not that big a deal for this workflow. But I know that this is the North Carolina NAD 83F, um, which is just US 83 foot. Um, and that's it. I press the create button and it's done. You can also just use the default LL 80, I think it's 87 or 83 out of the box, uh, or sorry, 84, and it will work. So now all I have to do is wait for an email that says, hey, your site's ready. And it's, it's really, really fast. Um, so you say, thanks, Autodesk. Let's go look at the site. Uh, and then we go into InfraWorks and this is where we can explore it. So you can choose to work locally or on Autodesk Docs. Um, working on Docs opens up a lot of workflows that you know involve other products like Revit. Um, I'm just gonna do locally for now. Um, and this is not cropped, like this is all like live timed. So it's pulling in all the GIS data from OpenStreetMap, OpenGIS, compiling the topo and doing all of that um, while I'm sitting here stalling, waiting for it to finish. Um, once it finishes opening up, you'll get a flash of my, uh, my email and then we'll jump into InfoWorks and here's your site um, with all of the procedurally generated buildings and your topography. And the topography is at elevation and does reflect um, the, the, the actual topography of the site, which we'll see when we go into Fortman. So now the next step is to start kind of cleaning things up because the fact of the matter is whether you're using Formit and the Dynamo plugin or InfraWorks or, or even like Cove tool, like procedurally generating buildings from satellite imagery always has errors in it. So like you have to go in and clean up the buildings at least a little bit. Um, it's really easy to just kind of drop the vertices out and then I can square up my buildings and clean them up. And the buildings are like, they're like Lego blocks. You can kind of squish them and push them around and make them bigger or smaller. Um, so it's, it's really super easy to use. Um, and just so you know, like I record this on my laptop, which has really low graphic settings, but like you can crank the graphic settings up and it starts to look like a video game. Uh, and yeah, so you go in and you kind of start cleaning up your buildings. You've got other options as well. Like each of the buildings has a style associated with it. So if I wanted to, I can um, just grab the building and change its skin style on the fly. You can actually define skin styles as well if you want to. Um, but this allows you to give sort of a context. Um, we have done projects where we've taken photographs of the front of buildings and made um, skins for buildings that look like the actual building. Uh, now, remember, we're not trying to create a real, like, realistic re recreation of the site. We're trying to create something for architectural visualization to understand context, right? That's really what we're going for. It has other applications, but that's what we use it for. Um, you can also do fly-throughs. So, like, this is going down um, Raleigh Road, and um, I don't have JavaScript installed, but if you did, you can do traffic simulations and you can do pedestrian simulations and things like that. It actually is pretty awesome. Um, and then my favorite part are the happy little trees. You've got lots of uh, site tools. So if I wanted to create a stand of trees for like just background context in my building, um, I place out my space and then InfraWorks will generate the trees for me. And I mean, this is very much like Twin Motion or, or, or Lumion where I can adjust the density. And you can actually mix these trees up, change their sizes. You can do all kinds of fun stuff. Um, like if I go in, I can independently control the trees as well as I could control the whole mass as well. Swap out the different tree types. You know, trees are friends. Like you can't, get, can't go wrong with trees. Um, and InfraWorks comes with a great collection of um, site design tools, but you can also create your own. Now, I want you to see the detail that InfraWorks actually generates. Every single tree has every single leaf on it actually generated through um, a skin, and it, it provides a very compelling um, visualization. It is also uh, com like really, really hard on Formit and Revit if you're not careful when you're trying to make that bridge, which is what we're going to talk about in a second. Um, then you also can lay out your um, site 
grading areas. So like if you're planning a building layout, you would create different proposals, which are like design options. And then I'm gonna come into here, I'm gonna lay a concrete pad out. Um, and this is really nothing more than like a building pad. So I drop this down on the floor or on the site and it'll actually grade the site for me automatically and it'll adjust the grading. And now I can look at it from the side and see what's my relationship to the road, that kind of stuff. And if I wanna adjust that elevation, I can, and it will adjust the road, it will adjust the um, contours and everything. Now, if you actually know anything about civil, um, you can actually do stormwater analysis, um, do all your, your sewer and utility lines and everything. Um, and it's, it's pretty awesome. Um, so then finally, we want to get this out of InfoWorks. You can use InfoWorks for a lot of things, um, but we want to bring this into format so we can then start playing around with it. So you pick what you want to export or you can use a pre-saved one. I have found that always using a polygon helps a lot. If you choose entire model, it takes a long time sometimes for, for uh, InfoWorks to process this. So I always recommend drawing a line or drawing your polygon around what you actually want to bring in to um, form it. So there's your, there's your outline. If you needed a shape file, you could actually use a specific shape file. Um, your coordinate system, which doesn't matter in this specific workflows, but if you are coordinating or tying into Civil 3D, it, it certainly does matter. Um, and then we're going to choose, do we want this whole thing to come out as like one big FBX or do we want to break it up? And since we're going into form it, we want to break it up. So you can see we got the ground, the buildings and the trees as separate FBX files. More on trees in a second. Um, what's really important here, since we're going into form it, is to toggle off merge objects with the same texture because it's how uh, InfraWorks and form it manage objects. This will actually make objects of the same texture in InfraWorks one object in format. And it took me a long time to figure that out before I realized like, I'd go to move like one building and like half the east walls of all my buildings would move. I'm like, I don't understand what's going on. It's like, it's because InfraWorks manages textures differently than the way like format manages objects. So it's really important we're going cross, prod cross product to understand those kind of nuances. So, we're now out of InfoWorks. We go into Formit. By the way, one of my favorite tools. Um, as far as location goes with Formit, it's really easy. Um, it's completely independent from InfoWorks. So I just type in my city. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to get to a weather station that's near our site. So I type in the city, zoom out, and I can see there's a weather station that's six miles to the west. And this is the one I'm gonna use. And this is gonna be used for sun studies. It's gonna be used for thermal and energy analysis. It's, it's basically like where all the weather data comes from. So that sets, my, that sets my location. Now, the next thing I wanna do is then start bringing in those, for, those InfraWorks exports. And there's different ones for each of the layers I exported. Um, I forgot to do my building pad. Otherwise I would have a building pad as well. Um, and because I didn't export the building pad, I don't have a, I don't have an adjusted topo that will come up. But here is my topo. It, it's actually like you can see it's at the correct elevation. It's not a flat block like what the Dynamo plugin does for Formit. Um, and then the next thing is bringing in my buildings. And I go ahead and just import the buildings and bingo, bingo. I should have buildings that appear. There's my buildings. Um, the, what I like about this is everything's using the same origin. So like alignment is super easy. You just have to remember to hit escape after you bring it in. Otherwise you'll place it in the wrong spot. Um, and then finally a note on trees. Remember I said that cross product workflows are really important to understand. And this is where modeling matters. Well, all those individual little triangles that, um, InfoWorks uses come in to form it as individual elements. So if you want to bring trees into form it, I would recommend bringing in only a few um, or you have like a water cooled supercomputer that can handle like this much graphical analysis because form it has to handle every single one of those, tri those triangles when you rotate zoom and it's, it gets pretty wild. So just can note on that. A simplified tree? Yes. Okay. So you can bring in form it and InfraWorks are like, um, they're sandboxes, so you can bring in just about as many file types as 
Navisworks can handle. So it's like, it's very fluid. So we have people bringing SketchUp stuff. We, it's, it's wild. I love working in a uh, format, but yeah, just be aware. Um, okay. So now that we, like we have a site, we have trees. I mean, we have our, um, our buildings and everything. One of the things, remember cross product we have to remember is that these elements are generated differently in InfoWorks than they are in Formit. So in Formit, you can see like it's, it's all surfaces because that's how InfoWorks handles it. But if I wanted to manipulate this element in Formit, it's actually quite easy. I just have to select all the, all the building sides and make it a group. And then I use Control X to cut it out of the group and just control X, exit the group, and then control shift V and it places it right back in its original location. So now I have an individual building I can now manipulate and work with. Um, and then make sure you add it to the right layer. Of course, layers are really important, just like work sets are to anybody in my firm that's listening. And then um, the last part before we do anything like going like, do any actual work is to organize your model. Cause all this stuff comes in like, on the same layer. So we'll want to put the ground on the ground layer and the buildings on the building layer. Um, and it's just a matter of picking the object and then like assigning it to the layer. This will, this makes life a lot easier, especially if you're going in and out of Revit with Formit, because you can see I could turn off the on, on and off the visibility and the lock, and then I can turn off the export to Revit. So if I'm going back and forth between Formit and Revit, that's how I can kind of organize and control the chaos that's going back and forth. And then I just put the rest of my buildings on the building layer. We'll skip to the next video. So here's my, uh, my architectural masterpiece. Um, you can see why I'm a BIM manager, not an architect. And um, this is where the fun happens, right? You could, you could start sandboxing and shaping your building. You could start like kind of laying it out, seeing what, how it works. Um, playing with it on the site. And then I could take it and this is where I can start doing my solar analysis and my energy analysis work. So if I wanted to see how this, you know, this architectural um, design works, I can now start generating um, solar analysis. And then you got all the solar tools that are associated with Formit. And, um, and if I want, I could do the whole building for either like a specific time of year or a cumulative year. And since this is in the south, the southeast the United States, like it's basically going to be a giant red cube unless you have some sort of like 50 foot obelisk next to your building. Um, that being said, the procedurally generated buildings from InfraWorks are actually fairly accurate to their true um, elevation because it's, it's pulling open GIS data. So like if you're working in a dense like urban area, like a lot of your buildings are approximately the correct size. So then you'll actually get that shading impact because you're using the same location information in InfraWorks and at Formit. Um, and then you, if you want, you can go up into, um, you can go up into Insight and things like that. Um, now we're going to, you know, do the prep for export to Revit. And this is basically where if, if my, you know, beautiful artistic building is going to go out to Revit, I'm going to add it to its own layer so I can control that. And then this is the start of the continuation of that, that, that giant um, constellation of uh, products I showed at the beginning. We're getting ready to go into Revit. Um, and then we have that... Um, that back and forth between Revit and Formit, which in 2023 is phenomenal. Like if you haven't checked it out in a long time, like I would really go back and look at it. They have like, <clears throat> I predict that one day Formit will be the in-place modeler in Revit, but I'm kind of just speculating there. Um, so the final bit here is we're in Formit, like we're doing our 3D sandbox, we're shaping out our building. Um, so like this would be where we can go. From this point, we have our we have our sort of area and our site sort of laid out, um, and there's a lot we can do here. But then we can also go back and forth between Revit, or we can kind of go back and forth into um, Insight. And the great thing here is going from Format to Insight. You can kind of feed this back and forth between the two programs in Insight. Um, so very early in design, you can kind of understand how your site is impacting your design and impacting your, your uh, performance. 
So yeah, so there's a lot more here than we covered, but like I love InfoWorks um, and you're happy to download. I'm like, I'm happy to let you download this PowerPoint if you want, um, or you can just reach out to me. I'm pretty accessible on LinkedIn um, or Twitter. Um, but yeah, so that's my workflow. Hope you guys liked it. Well, thank you so much, Dan. That was really, really cool to see Foreman. And Heather, I agree. Looks like Foreman has improved quite a bit. Well, thank you all so much. It's two o'clock. We're going to be respectful of your time. Thank you all for coming. Really do greatly appreciate it. If you have any questions moving forward, make sure that you go on to our LinkedIn group. We will post the recording of today's session up there as well as any additional information. Thank you all so much, but in mm -hmm. particular, thank you to our presenters. Thank you.